Hello, this is Dr. David Nace from Innovacer, Chief Medical Officer, and we are about ready to start the presentation, Building Real Interoperable Health Systems of Tomorrow, a new framework. If everybody can just bear with us just another minute, we have the attendees streaming in, and we will get started in just one minute. Hello. And welcome to the webinar, Building Real Interoperable Healthcare Systems of Tomorrow, a New Framework. This is Dr. David Nace, Chief Medical Officer and Innovator, and I will be your panelist for today's webinar. Joining us in this webinar on interoperability will be Nathan Riggle, the Director of Analytics at Mercy ACO from Iowa, and Knav Hasja, who is the co-founder and chief product officer at Innovacer. I wanna welcome the audience who have come to hear this webinar, and I think you'll find some very interesting facts about interoperability, the holy grail that many of us in healthcare have been seeking to solve in our healthcare systems to better serve our patients. So if we can move on to the next slide, perfect. So just an overview of the agenda that we're going to cover today. We're going to speak about the future of healthcare. Where is healthcare heading? We all know that there's been lots of change on the horizon and that we've begun our journey. We'll describe what the healthcare systems of tomorrow will demand so we have a better sense of how interoperability fits into where we're going. And then we'll get into the very important question of what is interoperability? You'll learn that for many different people, that term means many different things and has many different challenges associated with it. Next, we'll go into the scope and the use of interoperability and describe some ways in which one would approach this concept and speak specifically about the semantic unification of data for healthcare and describe how a unified data model can be promoted to help really bring true interoperability to a healthcare system to achieve the goals we seek to achieve for the future of healthcare. Then we'll get into the recommended roadmap to achieve interoperability, and we'll give a case example from Mercy ACO and talk about the story of how they've achieved true interoperability. So a little background and construct for this discussion. We all know that healthcare is evolving very rapidly. There are many mergers and acquisitions going on between hospitals and health systems. With, there's an increasingly complex regulatory env environment in which we are all held to different rules and regulations and how information can be passed from one system to the other and one person to another. There has been a movement that we've largely embraced about having information be patient-centered as we want to deliver care that's patient-centered, and that creates additional complexities. As we move forward into this world of value-based care and population care, we know that the payment models to support this are changing, and it becomes very complex because we have many different payers using different payment models, which are changing year after year. And lastly, we've all heard of big data, Data continues to grow and grow in size and variety and types and changes keep occurring, creating this concept of interoperability always seeming to be just another yard away. So let's go over the history of the problem. So we all know that <clears throat> we had a stimulus plan that really helped us to adopt EMR. So going digital was the first attempt to adopt to a new world. We wanted to create digital records as a foundation for productivity and patient care. And so we created the electronic medical record, an alternative to the paper system, in which we built an application and created a, data, a database to help hold the data that would serve the EMR, the application, and the hardware to surround it. So organizations continue to purchase new applications as they began to move this journey into population health, they began to want a care coordination application with its own analytics and database underneath it. 
or a separate analytics tool for business intelligence and reporting with, again, its own database and applications underneath it. And lastly, we began to deal with the issue of workflow and create point of care tools for the physician. Again, new applications with their own database underneath it. So the problem this approach brought upon us is lots of silos. That the solutions are struggling to not only come to scale, but even be able to look across them. So with a patient-centered approach, you'd want a holistic view of the patient. And yet we had lots of different databases serving different applications, all having data in different formats, in different schemas, using different types of ontologies. So as the healthcare continues to move into more value-based care, the concept of interoperability seemed to get farther and farther away. So at this point, I believe we have a poll that we can administer. Some questions for you in the audience. What is the state of interoperability in your system today? So please select one of the following. Trustworthy interoperable data between all systems, trustworthy interoperable data between some systems, sometimes trustworthy, sometimes not between all systems, same question between some systems, or no interoperability yet, but you've budgeted out a plan to get there. So let's give the poll just a couple more seconds as you all choose your choice. to give a good reflection of where you've been. And when the results are in, we can bring up a result. Ah, and poll results are in. So this is very interesting. Sometimes trustworthy, sometimes not between some systems wins the day game. And no interoperability yet and trustworthy kind of between some systems in between. So nobody really getting to true, full trustworthy interoperability. Some people in the middle, some people on either side of not yet starting and kind of getting along the way but not quite trusting their data. That makes sense. So we've just begun our journey. Let's go on to the next slide. So let's think about where we want to be in the future. We all see that we've achieved some degree of interoperability, what we've just begun. I think what we need is a strong data foundation, not lots of silos with data serving different application, but rather data as a foundation for everything we do so that we can have a patient-centered view. That way, the whole system of care, the hospital and the health system, the ACO, the network, can be centered on a single data foundation and have a 360 degree view of a patient. And if the data is all in one system with a strong data foundation, it can be in a single data model that can serve all applications. And that way you achieve true collaboration to trustworthy interoperability of data between systems. So a little bit of issues about the facts of healthcare interoperability, some of which we've already discussed and discovered that true interoperability is critical to achieving the future of healthcare, to achieving the healthcare goals we want. That different people mean different things when they think of interoperability. Some people meaning a system can transmit information, some meaning it can transfer, transmit useful information that could be used, and others meaning that the two systems operate in real time using the same kind of language, if you will. So interoperability is complex because there are many different standards, there are many different languages, and it's not solved by just simply adopting an EMR. Data is complex, and it's getting complexer every day and every week with more variety of data, data from new sources, data coming at us faster and faster, the volume growing and growing, and the veracity or the trustworthiness of the data from each source being different and the impact on us as a healthcare system that's trying to evolve is huge. So with that, I'd like to turn over this panel presentation to Kanab Hasiji from Innovacer, head of product, and he'll go into a little bit more detail about how to achieve interoperability and what the road to getting there would be. 
Hello, Dr. Nais. Uh, thanks for the context. Uh, I think uh, before we move forward uh, to, to, to interoperability and going to the weeds of it, uh, there's one more quick poll that we have, uh, which something Dr. Nate alluded on is different people mean different things when they say interoperability. So let's just have a quick poll on, on what do you mean by interoperability? So uh, do you mean it's uh, that health IT systems can share data between themselves? Does it mean that health IT systems can emit and absorb data in different standard formats? Or data definition is mapped to a common model due to exchange, and then all stakeholders are on the same page on the information. So most people say that all stakeholders are on the same page on information exchange and everyone has answered on the, the above questions for a bit, which is actually good because that's, that's what I wanted to allude on next is uh, there, are, there are three different definitions of interoperability. Uh, one is technical interoperability, which most people believe is that two systems can talk to each other in some way. Uh, what way is informed, we're not sure yet, but they can exchange data between themselves using some communication protocols, be it a secured file transfer or a secured email or a, a RESTful API, whatever they would feel like, which is more of a technical communication medium. Then comes a point syntactic interoperability, which means that they can not just talk to each other, they can also absorb data in the standard format so that they can make sense, sense out of it. And in this meaningful use to world, we, we, are, we have seen evolutions of CDAs and HL7, then the new evolution of FHIR as common standards for interoperability between healthcare IT systems to talk to each other. But the biggest piece that most uh, people miss in interoperability is the semantic interoperability, which is that not just you can exchange uh, content in standard formats, the content itself means the same thing to all the healthcare IT systems, uh, which means if you are sharing, you know, Diagnosis codes are they in the same stack? If you are saying, if you are, if you are sharing a place of service code, is it in the same standard? And a true interoperability is achieved if all technical, syntactic, and semantic interoperability is achieved between healthcare IT systems. And semantic is the most toughest one to to take care of in this complex world of varied, uh, uh, high volume and high velocity healthcare data that we need to deal with. So let's come to the scope and use of interoperability uh, and not just what it means or what shapes and forms in it exists in as, as what we have seen in the market. There are, in this new evolution of a care team concept coming in because of value-based care, there are these, these uh, these stakeholders, starting from a physician or a medical assistant at the point of care, who needs to close more care gaps or coding gaps uh, to get to get more uh, revenue in pay for performance or start adding reimbursements, and and those those gaps need to come in with a with, with a context that the physician can understand what those gaps mean and they are on the same page at the point of care in as much real time uh, as possible. For patient, they need to get more of their own clinical medical records. They need to get insights on, on how much they're spending. They need to get insights on uh, the medications they have prescribed and dispensed and so, so on. And need to get those constant reminders on visits and medications so that they can take care of their own self care. While a care coordinator needs a unified clinical data of the, that longitudinal patient record as we speak to do disease 
these management and foundation of care managements uh, seamlessly and they have this data from all the EMRs and the claims in that network that, that they want. For a practice staff, uh, referral management becomes a very crucial point wherein they have the data of specialist cost and quality metrics so that they can take data-driven decisions on referrals. And again, they need to be on the same page. What do you mean by cost and quality metrics of specialists? So you need semantic, semantic and property there as well. And finally, uh, a PCP needs to receive a, a CDA back from a specialist so that a continuity of care is maintained and thus the, the, the whole continuum of care makes it more efficient and low cost, thus driving shared savings. So these are a few different use cases that, uh, that you need to invest your time and money in interoperability to get those returns back. And of course, they have to be as real time as possible. And with that unified data, with a semantic unification, which means everyone is on the same page when they say what this data means. When we say semantic unification, it's, it's, it's very crucial that there are more than 100 data fields out there in, in healthcare data which affects your downstream measurements, your, your outcomes, uh, or the, the whole care team engagement, if they're not coded right and, and if they're not unified in the same way with a common definition, you will not achieve true interoperability. And, and uh, everyone will be speaking a different language in terms of uh, measures or care gaps or uh, are they on multiple medications? Are they frequently visiting to ED and so on? And for, for achieving that semantic unification, you need to maintain this uh, uh, taxonomy and ontology database within your system to make sure that there are crosswalks available between all the systems. As you can see an example below, it's a very simplistic example wherein there are different ways a gender is defined in different systems and unless you maintain that crosswalk of, of what, what each system means in terms of gender you will not be able to generate desired results on what clinical outcomes to take on this patient and as you can see on the, on the right hand side ranging from uh, subscribers to language procedure diagnosis modifiers and whatnot there are about 100 of those fields which have to be semantically unified before you, you start exchanging data between systems. And the second most important piece in, in interoperability as a backbone is an enterprise master patient index. You have to uniquely identify patients across your systems because there's no common identifier available as such. And in our experience, the goals have to be twofold. You need to have zero split scenarios. What I mean by that is you should not be in a situation with your uh, enterprise master patient index management that you have to combine two members into one, one ID. While you can manage to skip combining some, some IDs into one member, because if you, if you, and obviously, uh, uh, combine two members into one ID, then you will be uh, providing them wrong diagnosis, uh, you will be providing them wrong medications, and the clinical outcomes will be affected. And the second most important point is that uh, when you are trying to do an enterprise master patient index uh, approach in terms of unifying your patient data, it has to be data driven because every demographic is different. There's no one size fit all. Uh, I remember when we we used to change our our rules for EMPI from the state of Iowa to to the, the, the islands in Puerto Rico, same rules don't work. And you have to change those rules and it has to be done in a data driven way. And the approach is you have to cleanse this data really well. You have to uh, create a matching logic 
if it's a probabilistic matching, you have to triangulate those results with more data fields like addresses and emails. And you could probably tie break them uh, depending on race or ethnicity if it's a probabilistic match. But the most important thing is having these diagnostics around your, your enterprise master patient index to be really sure that you are uniquely identifying patients and you are not erroneously combining two patients into one ID. Once you do that, uh, there is a recommended roadmap to interoperability because you, there's so much data that you need to manage today, uh, starting from claims to clinical AD immunization feeds, uh, patient self-reported data, that if you go towards the road to interoperability, you cannot do that in one go. And the way we have seen our customers or our partners realizing value from interoperability is they first try to unify the claims and ADT data together because that helps you to not just track cost, quality, risk, and utilization outcomes and measures, but also helps you to drive real-time care management, especially in transitions of care uh, when a patient gets admitted or discharged or transferred. That's the first value because this uh, combining claims and ADD together is less of a lift as compared to combining clinical data because clinical data will be more varied and more disparate in a system by, by design. And you can achieve a lot of value from, from, from cost, quality, risk, and utilization management with a real-time uh, notifications of ADDs helping you drive transitions of care. Once you have achieved that, the next step is to move towards clinical data, which is more varied, uh, which is more no which is more noisy and uh, and not so clean as compared to claims. But once you achieve that clinical data unification together, you can engage with the physician teams, and and you can drive physicians with real time in real time insights on care gaps, coding gaps, and some other insights which are not in their own EMR. Just having EMR and just by uh, you know adding EMRs, the same EMR in your network, you cannot achieve true interoperability because you need to also integrate the ADA defeats, claims, immunization, and whatnot. So having one single EMR system is not the answer to interoperability. The answer is that you have to you have to take that road and you have to integrate all your feeds together. And within your own EMR, you won't have a good lens of what's happening out of network. A physician will not know whether they are, they are seeing other PCPs, whether they are on different medications than what they have prescribed. And getting all those insights back at the point of care uh, helps drive physician behavior towards better care for the patient. And lastly, you also bring in the patient in the same, in the same circle of care and, and drive them towards self-care. So you integrate the patient's self-reported data, they get engaged uh, on relevant education material, reminders, and care plans, and you can aid them into real-time appointment booking, refer management, or goal management to, to, to drive their own care. And they can see their own clinical data as well. So after phase three, what you have done is, you have made sure that your care coordinator, your physician, uh, the physician's medical assistant, the physician staff, the patient, all of them have the same information and they are assessing that information in the same way. And that is true interoperability. And that's when your cost of care goes, goes down with high quality. So that's a recommended roadmap to interoperability. Do not go uh, all in one that you, you need to integrate all the systems in one go. You must take this three-step phase approach, but make sure that you, you are able to drive true value with each phase and you're, you're able to measure that with the right trustworthy data you have. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll pass it on to, uh, to Nathan to speak about how they have achieved interoperability at Mercy ACL. Yeah, thanks, Kanav. Um, hi, everyone. This is a 
recap, my name is Nathan Riggle and I am the Director of Analytics at Mercy ACO. I'll give you a brief background of my organization, some of our data and interoperability challenges, and then kind of go into you know, how, we're, how we're proceeding with dealing with those challenges. So I'll start with a summary of my organization. So, so my company's title is Mercy Accountable Care Organization, but we're actually a subsidiary of Mercy Health Network which is one of the two large provider networks in the state of Iowa. So for those of you less familiar with the, the shape of Iowa, we've provided that for you on the screen. Um, so a little bit about our network, um, just like the state, our major population center is in Des Moines, which is that central Iowa bubble there. Um, but Iowa has several smaller cities across the state, um, several on the rivers, and you can see those listed there. Um, that's the coverage of Mercy Health Network, which again is one of the two large market share provider groups in the state. Um, so as an ACO, um, you know, we handle all of the value-based contract and care management strategies for the network and for those people, those groups in the network that decide to join those entities. <clears throat> so a little bit more about us. Um, you can see there we have about 3,100 or 300, 310,000 attributed lives across 20 different value-based agreements. So that's split between our four different Medicare shared savings programs, um, our, our managed Medicaid agreements here in Iowa, and then our different commercial contracts. Um, so 3,100,000 um, attributed lives, and that um, covered, we also have about 3,500 providers in the network. So as I recapped earlier, um, you know, as an ACO, we're focused on um, the utilization um, of those contracts as well as the other value-based needs. So in this slide, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the challenges <clears throat> that we face as an organization with data and interoperability. I don't know um, how, you, I'm sure some of you at least on this call experience the same thing as us, but we actually have a very dispersed e EHR ecosystem across the network. If you remember that map I had on the previous page, we actually have 15 different types of EHRs across the different members in our network. So um, in our opinion, a fairly dispersed, complicated ER, EHR landscape. Um, as Kanav has touched on earlier, when you have that situation, it can be quite challenging to really under, you know, see the patient across the care continuum. So very focused for us to try to um, break through that challenge and see if we could find some interoperability solution, to bring our EHRs together, um, which I'll talk about later. Um, another, another challenge as we think about our different care management strategies are <clears throat> having that real-time data to really react to. So as our care management staff, which is, the, which is the main field force we have working with patients, we call them care managers, as they work with the patients, you know, making sure we're, we're providing technology, um, to enable that work, see care gaps, see real-time data as much as possible. And then lastly, um, I think a good call out here is GPRO, but just other needs, if you think about a complicated system, um, you know, we wanted to give our care management staff some ability to do some manual data entry as well. So already have a pretty complex data situation, but we wanted to add manual data to that as well because there was some real good clinical value there. So on the next slide, I'll talk to you a little bit about what we decided to do. So we've actually co-developed a data platform with Innovacer to help close these data needs and really enable our different strategies. So can I touch on this a little bit later, but you can see the systems that we actually decided to include in our data system. So um, EHRs was, was critical to us. We knew we had a very complex EHR landscape and we wanted to incorporate that as much as possible. So we've actually in, um, ingested all of the key clinical elements from all of our different EHRs into the, the data lake that sits below this platform. With that, we've also pulled in all of the billing information. So both the EHR and billing information is for all of our ambulatory and acute settings. So pulled all of those in. Um, ADTs is, is very critical to us, and I mentioned those earlier. Those are some of the most important feeds we have to trigger our different care management work, which I'll talk about later, but getting those feeds as real time as possible so we could track our patients um, when they are going into the ER or inpatient setting. Um, bring in the payer claims data, another huge data set, but that's 
very critical for us as we try to optimize our value-based performance. And then you can see scheduling and HIE information kind of rounding out what we're bringing into this huge data system. So, so with that, have, have co-developed this, this data lake with Innovacer, um, utilize their technology expertise in being able to connect to these different systems to bring the data into one platform. Um, I'll, the next slide, I'll go into a little more strategies, but quickly, um, dashboards is critical for us. So we're able to basically create um, you know, any dashboard we want to create, and I'll, I'll specifically focus on our value-based contracts because we have the payer claims data, but we're also enriching it with the EHRs and billing. We build very robust value-based dashboards to monitor the performance of our different value-based contracts. Um, but probably even more important than that is the large care management staff we have across the state. Um, we also in our system have developed the care management workflow and operations so that our care managers can value or can benefit from this rich data set as much as possible so that we're, we're pushing all of that rich patient data, but we're also triggering different workflows based on patient gaps and other things beneficial to their work. So then on the next slide, some of those more, I'll kind of talk you through what those specific strategies look like. So at this point, um, I think you've kind of, hopefully you're, you're very comfortable with the description of our organization, our interoperability and data challenges. Um, but, but like I said, we wanted to, you know, we believe there was a solution out there to help us meet our needs. So we work, you know, build a data lake that could integrate all of that data and then build a platform on top of that data lake to drive our strategies. So, I'll summarize some of our main ACO strategies. The first being event-based triggers. So as we get those um, nightly ADT feeds, we're able to see all of our patients within our network that have been admitted to inpatient and ED, and we are actually able to automate the programming of sending notifications to care managers for those attributed patients. So as those patients come in and we see those um, across every single one of our hospitals, we then push those patients back to the care manager who they're attributed to based on their location to let them know our, where they're at and what they've been admitted with. Um, and then that trigger, triggers several different care management workflows and then helping to, to, to work with that patient. Um, related to care management is the closing of all the gaps in care. So, you know, closing gaps in care is very important to us from a population health focus, but all of our different value-based contracts obviously put a key focus on that. So, so with those dashboards I mentioned earlier, with the ability to monitor our patients based on what we see in claims, what we see from the different EMR feeds, the billing feeds, we try to keep as accurate a picture as possible of all of our different gaps in care um, so that we can also work with our care management staff and other strategies in the organization to coordinate with those patients to close those gaps in care. So for example, um, some of the key measures, if you can think of mammograms, PCP visits, et cetera, trying to, trying to really focus on real time views of that as much as possible. And then again, triggering automatic workflows for some of those things. So, so if, if we have a specific population that the PCP visit is a, a, is a specific focus for the next month or two, really trying to track as many patients as possible that are, that are coming up for the need of that PCP visit and pushing that to care managers. Um, so the third bullet I'll talk about is the commu improved communication, um, which I think touches a lot on what I've already discussed. I think just having real-time data and pushing it is, is great improvements in care coordination. And I think this first bullet um, does a nice job of describing you know, continuum of care with the virtual handoffs. So really trying to automate that workflow in our system. Since we've built this great data lake, with all this different data, let's automate these different workflows um, and make those virtual handoffs as clear and efficient as possible. And then, as I mentioned earlier, with the manual data entry, some of that manual data entry is clinical information if we feel that it's it's missing in our data lake, but it's also important care timeline information. So being able to leave notes for anyone in the system to see specific um, specific details for different patients. And then lastly, um, other data that we're bringing in is this, this communi community engagement strategy. So <clears throat> as we focus more on social determinants of health and more community care uh, or community resources, looking for other data feeds to integrate into our system. 
um, and then collecting additional data on the patient for community, community needs so that again, we can enrich our data set, but also op, um, automate workflows. So those are our main strategies. So those were our, um, that's my back, those are our background, those are our challenges, here's our strategies. Um, and I think the, I think the, um, I think the outcomes, even without coming to this page, are obvious, but if we come in here, um, here, here's some of the key financial outcomes we've achieved. So as we try to use our data to actually monitor these outcomes, um, we've, we've, we've helped achieve higher savings in our commercial contracts. Um, number two, and I've talked a lot about this, is as we automated workflow, we've helped save hours for our care coordinators so that we can continue to put them to work to the most valuable time with our patients. Um, three or four key utilization measures. So as we've tracked um, our patients coming in and out of the hospital and other gaps in care, by pushing those to our care managers, we've really worked to drive down those utilization measures. And then lastly, five and six, a couple key population health, me health measures um, have helped to increase our primary care services and our annual wellness rate. So with that, um, hopefully that gives you a little bit of a picture of, of us, our challenges, um, but our confidence in saying, hey, we can find a solution for interoperability. If we do so, here's how we can make it beneficial for, for our organization. Okay, thanks, Nathan, um, for giving a brief of mercy. Uh, I think lastly, before uh, we get to the questions and answers, and we have got a bunch of questions out here, which we would love to answer as well. Uh, I wanted to talk about the view of the future. How how does uh, how does interoperability a true interoperable healthcare system looks like according to us, and how and how you can get there. So before I talk about this this view of the future, uh, there's one last poll which we have, which we want to launch is, which use cases of interoperability are you trying to solve in a system? Are you trying to, to get the clinical data between the ambulatory sites and acute settings on the same page? Are you trying to, uh, to integrate your claims data from all the pairs? Are you trying to get the ADT feeds and immunization feeds in? And then you know uh, a patient's self-reported data, and if, if there's something else, you can put in the questions box, and we can pick it up from there. You have to punch in some answers right away. All right, <laughs> let's look at the results. So very interesting. Uh, clinical data interoperability and claims data interoperability. I think are the most uh, biggest use cases that we can see, and followed by ADT and patients' self-reported data, which makes sense from the from the way the incentives are, are are aligned today. And interoperability is very important for the for the incentives that are future. <clears throat> In this new era of fee for service and value-based care world, where we if we are trying to uh, to merge both the worlds together. It is very important to keep all your stakeholders on the same page as we just discussed a few, a few slides back. It is important for your ACO leader or the CIN leader at the bottom to have that analytical view of their population with trustworthy data and trustworthy insights, which can only happen if you have a semantic data unification in place. It is very important for your care coordinator to have a whole unified longitudinal patient record so that he or she can take care of that, that patient in conditions of care uh, or disease management or utilization management. At the same time, it is very important for the patient to have their own data so that they can take care of their own care and have the right set of reminders of them on medications or visits it is also important for your provider to then have those right sets of insights around you know, gaps in care or uh, clinical documentation improvements or any educational material like uh, this, this, this patient is 
high the utilizer and so on at the point of care while he or she is seeing the patient so that they can take out the patient very well and form deeper relationships with that patient. And finally, it is important for your practice management staff to also have all the information of this patient so that they can manage referrals really well, uh, which are data driven. Uh, they can uh, they can align on the right intake forms, the whole experience from a patient walking in from to the practice to, to moving out with with reminders and referrals in place. So with that, I just want to pause for a moment and show you uh, a few of these glimpses of, of how this of how this uh, true and profitable platform looks like. So the first thing I want to show you is uh, I'm going to turn over to showing you how how a patient experience looks like. Imagine that we send a message to a patient through a platform about a reminder for the A1C test because we have that trustworthy data. Once I connect and send this message, there is a secure link that goes into uh, where patient can set their own passwords for receiving future messages. And they got they got a text on that your diabetes A1C is overdue and they can click on this video within this message where a doctor is appealing on why A1C test is so important for you. This, uh, this can only happen if you have a true interoperable platform wherein you're able to receive the message and you're, you're, you're able to know that this patient has an A1C test queue. And a physician can engage back with your patients, not only in textual formats, but more uh, uh, media heavy content format like videos and audios and PDF files. This is how your patient view of the future starting from a patient to a care manager uh, to a physician having that unified data view where you are on the same page and all the definitions of your semantics uh, your clinical data uh, definitions your concept maps are in the same place is when you achieve true interoperability and you must always achieve that in a stepwise format starting from integrating your claims and entities moving towards clinical and then moving towards a patient-centered care so with that uh, i would like to take up questions and open the floor to all our panelists to answer them one of the questions is which i think dr nes you should talk, talk about first uh, has HIPAA restricted interoperability instead of catalyzing it? Well, that's an excellent question, Kanav. You know, HIPAA was originally designed with the idea that we were moving to a digital health system, and it was designed to ensure the flow of information to all those people who needed it, the stakeholders, all of the clinicians, the uh, physicians, the nurses, the doctors, the hospitals, the practices, as well as the patients and people the patients designated to receive the information and participate. Unfortunately, it has had the opposite effect because of misinterpretation and some regulatory uh, efforts at the hospital or health system level in which people have been afraid to violate the regulation, so they've uh, said, no, we can't give you this information because of HIPAA. So there's been many attempts to try to revisit that, but today this misunderstanding of HIPAA is often a barrier to achieving true interoperability, even when the systems are in place. Great. Thanks, Ardenes. I think the second question is about uh, for Mercy ACO, so Nathan, you can take a first stab and then I can answer that. Uh, it appears that Mercy ACO has solved the challenges of interoperability when it comes to existing EHRs and other clinical systems. But is it a challenge for you when you need to add more different types of systems into your interoperable data platform? <clears throat> Yeah, great question. Um, what we're trying to set ourselves up for is continual evolution. So um, 
I actually have members of my staff who are responsible with networking with all of the different organizations in our network to understand kind of where they're headed with different EMRs. So we're very open-minded to the fact that EMRs will change, maybe consolidate more, maybe split even further. So um, when that happens, we work to um, continue to close the gap as we are today. So we've, we've added that into our process. The other point I would add is um, it's also important for my team as we work with the different stakeholders to really focus on data governance as well. So because we have so many different EMRs, we do want to make sure that we're providing some consulting governance on um, the right way to structure those backend databases. Because while I think it's, it is definitely possible to solve interoperability challenges with different EMRs, um, it, it's a much easier challenge to accomplish if, if you have similar data standards in terms of using link codes for labs, um, standardized codes for all the other um, items as well. So hopefully that helped answer that question. Yeah, that's a good point you uh, you, you picked up, uh, Nathan, is data governance, because as we get more varied systems, it's not about just the technology and and the way you handle it. It's also about data governance, as well as uh, flexibility in planning which data do you want to take in first. I think that's one approach that Mercy always took uh, with us. and and we took with them and we learned from them is, uh, like you can see on the slide, integrate the claims and ADT first, then move to the clinical data where you have more attributed population and less number of connections, and then cover the whole big long tail that that always comes into your, into your different EMR world. So I think data governance at the same time, uh, prioritization of which data do you want to pick up first and and uh, fight the battle is very important. Uh, if I want to look at a, a patient, and all of this is dummy data, so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, if I go inside a patient, as a care manager, you can look at the whole longitudinal record, starting from clinical overview uh, to who their PCP are, what their risk scores are, to see their measure gaps the active care models that they have they are being worked upon with different care teams and 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 I'm not the only one in the care team here but there are, there are more members who are taking care of it and you can you can look at the labs procedures diagnosis visits and medications across different systems claims clinical all combined and if you look at the care ma management timeline on what has happened with this patient with different care strategies and protocols being attempted to uh, picking up any uh, care protocol and working towards it step by step. You can only achieve that if you have that longitudinal unified patient data record coming from different systems together. And you don't have to go back and look into your PCP DMR or, or look at the claim feeds in a separate uh, instance or go, go to the immunization feed portal to look at the immunization feeds. All is at one place for you to coordinate the care for the patient. So this is how you bring in all the data together and make it a unified data lens, which, which helps your, your uh, physicians, your care coordinators, your patients to, to kind of uh, work towards being on the same page of data and making it truly interoperable for all stakeholders. To, to deliver care collaboratively with trustworthy data. Now that you have seen how uh, a truly interoperable platform interacts with the patient and the care manager to be on the same page, let's look at how this platform can interact with the physician. Uh, it's very important that physician's workflow is not disturbed uh, when he or she is interacting with the patient. So let's go inside Let's, let's suppose uh, I have a patient walking in, Jane Doe, and I click on the patient. While I'm reading uh, the patient's chart, what happens is an application from the background pops up, which has more information from this tool, truly interoperable platform showing the quality gaps and the potential coding gaps that might, might exist for this patient. This gives a precise information of, of, of what the physician must work on this patient besides diagnosis, the, diagnosing the patient or 
or, or attempting to heal them. You can click on those gaps once you have worked upon them and this truly interoperable platform gets to know the message that the, that the physician has worked on it. And it tries to recapture uh, whether the, the physician has truly worked on it or not in real time. If you don't, as a physician, don't like this message and it's disturbing your workflow, you, you, within one click, you can collapse it and it goes away. That's how uh, a physician within the existing workflow can work on more data than just what they see in the EMR. With that, we are running out of time. So Dr. Nesh, do you have any concluding remarks? And, and Nathan, do you have any concluding remarks before we uh, end this webinar? I do. Um, this was actually very enlightening. And I see the interoperability and the path to achieving it is so critical to really knowing exactly what you're doing in healthcare knowing how to best serve the patient and delivering sound quality care in a timely way. Uh, Nathan, I think that you provided an excellent overview of a very complex system statewide in which you've been able to achieve this. So some parting comments from you. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Nees. <clears throat> yeah, the only parting comments would be that um, I think a lot of different networks can have similar situations to our own. I, I know that, in fact, there is quite a bit of similar challenges. I think technology has grown to a point that we have some really great opportunities um, and pretty efficient and cost-effective ways to, to bypass some of those challenges. Um, so I think, you know, I, I feel really great about that for my company as well as, as we all grow in the future. And then I would echo what I said earlier, and Dr. Nay summarized there, is that um, when you have this big data, you know, you have to first get it together. But then once you do, you've got a really valuable source to, to offer the best possible care for patients. So with that, uh, that would wrap our summary up for the webinar today on interoperability. I hope that each of you who participated learn valuable lessons as each of us, even as panelists did from each other. And we uh, thank you for joining us in this Innovator sponsored webinar, interoperability and how to get there and the role of interoperability in the future. Thank you very much and good day.